All right, the last story I'll mention is uh, one that has been really impactful in my life in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. So turn there if you would. And this text, of course, is a sermon all on its own. I've preached this story many, many times over the course of the church's ministry. But I want to point out a couple of things. Jesus is invited to a home for dinner. So the last story was about uh, being at dinner. This story is about being at dinner. There's a Pharisee, a religious leader, his name is Simon. And he's invited Jesus to come to his house to have a nice dinner. And he's undoubtedly invited all of his friends so he can show that, hey, I got, the prom- I got this really popular rabbi coming over. Let's all sit and listen to him. We'll pepper him with questions and see what he has to say. So there they are in this house. And, uh, and by the way, the word Pharisee, uh, we think, comes from, an, uh, from a uh, Hebrew word, and an Aramaic word, that, are, uh, that mean separated ones. So the Pharisees were a religious party in the first century. Jesus agreed with much of what they had to say, and not so much in other places. He was constantly frustrating them because they believed that they were to separate themselves from sinful people and to separate themselves from sin and to prove to everybody to, to really appear pious and to set an example of what piety actually looks like. And they went to the nth degree on pursuing little pious things that they could do, but sometimes they did it to show off or to show themselves to be pious as opposed to actually having true piety in their hearts. And they turned away many people who were sinners uh, and they made them feel like they were less than, they couldn't, they couldn't associate you know, with them. And so here Simon is having Jesus over. They have this dinner. They reclined on the floor. So they ate at, round, you know, at curved or U-shaped tables. They were called triclinium, three-sided. And, and they would recline with an elbow on the table. And they ate with their fingers, of course, in this you know, Middle Eastern tradition. And, and they're reclining on cushions, their feet behind them. And suddenly there's a woman who walks into the room. She barge, barges into the house and she's looking for Jesus. And you could almost hear everyone around the table gasp. Because this woman, Luke tells us, was a sinner. Now, everybody was a sinner. So when Luke tells us that this woman was a sinner, he's saying she was a notorious sinner. In that small village, she was a notorious sinner. What does that mean? Well, we don't know for sure. She might have been an addict. Uh, there were the equivalent of drugs in the first century. She might have been an addict. She might have been an alcoholic. Uh, she might have been an adulteress, maybe a serial adulteress. Or she might have been the town prostitute. We simply don't know. Usually, it's assumed that she was the town prostitute. And so this woman comes in, she's holding a little alabaster flask with the most precious thing that she owns. It's a vial filled with very expensive scented perfume or oil, scented oil. And uh, and she has this with her and she's searching for Jesus. She's searching for Jesus. And and you have to read into the story what what Luke doesn't tell us. Why is she searching for him? Why has she brought this precious thing to annoy him with? Well, clearly somewhere earlier in the day, she's heard Jesus preach. Maybe his eyes met her eyes. Maybe he looked at her and told her about the love of God and and talked to her about the God of mercy and grace who forgave sinners and that you could be made new. Whatever it was, it changed her. And so she shows up and she's showing up at a Pharisee's house. Can you imagine how much courage it took for her to show up at this house? She shows up there, she barges in, she's looking for Jesus. She looks around, she finally sees him. She goes over to stand right behind him and she's weeping. She's sobbing, the tears are flowing down her face and, and they land on his feet. And then she gets down on her knees and she lets down her hair and she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And you could just imagine all of these very pious Pharisees and the you know, people like them. And, and Simon the Pharisee, who's, who's you know, the, hosting the dinner, in his mind, in fact, Luke tells us what he's thinking. He's thinking to himself, does this man know, not know what kind of woman she is? Does he not know how sinful she is? Why is he letting her touch him? And then she breaks open this expensive vial of ointment and she pours it on his feet. She anoints his feet. You remember the word Messiah means anointed one. And typically that was like the high priest would anoint a king. But in this case, it's perhaps a prostitute who anoints the king. Do You see this picture here? I mean, he lifts up the lowly. Like in, in first century Judaism in a town, to be the town harlot would be the lowest place you could be as a woman. And here's what we need to understand. You know, nobody, no little girl in Judaism grew up thinking, I hope I get to be the town harlot, right? They grew up never wanting to be that. So what happened? And we don't know. We have to imagine. We have to use our imagination when we're reading this story. Was she, was she abused by her father or some other men in her life? Damaged goods so no one else would be with her? Was she, was she uh, you know, left behind by her family. Maybe, maybe everyone had died. And, and again, it took a male to provide a living for most women. And so this is the only livelihood she could find. We don't know. What we know is that there was a lot of pain behind this. There's likely a lot of brokenness, a lot of hurt. But this is her job. This is what she does. And so Jesus looks at, the, at Simon the Pharisee. And Simon, who's, who can't understand how Jesus could possibly allow her to touch him. And he asks a couple questions. He said, Simon, let me ask you something. 
let's suppose that there were two, two men who owed a debt to a third person, uh, the, the owed a debt to the bank, let's say. And, uh, and as they owed this debt to their creditor, uh, one owed, uh, owed a huge sum and one a small sum. And, and let's just say that the creditor decided to forgive both of them of the debt that they owed. Which one do you think would be more grateful? The one who was forgiven little or the one who was forgiven much? And Simon says, well, of course, the one who was forgiven much. And I imagine Jesus just sitting there in silence for a moment as this woman's weeping at his feet. Uh, Simon, do you get it? Do you understand? And then he turned to the woman as if, as if, you know, to make this crystal clear. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Like, you're clean. God is the God of the second chance. You're new. God has, God has blotted away all of those things. And what do the Pharisees do? They, they begin getting irritated. Like, well, who is Jesus to announce somebody has been forgiven? That's only God's job. Of course, they don't understand that God has come in the flesh with them in Jesus. And, and then Jesus turns to her and he says to her, woman, I want to bless you. And I want you to know that you can go in peace. Now, in the midst of this, before Jesus says this to the woman, Jesus turns to Simon and he says, Simon, do you see this woman? Simon, do you see this woman? Do you, do you, do you only see the things that she's done that you disapprove of? Do you only see the fact that she is somehow down here at the very bottom of the socioeconomic and cultural and religious scale in the city? Or do you see that she's a human being? Do you see that she was someone's daughter? Do you see that there was some pain that led her to this life? You see, this isn't what she wanted to do. This wasn't what she dreamt of doing. Can you imagine, Simon? Do you see her and can you imagine what it feels like to be her? Or do you only see the sin that you disapprove of in her life? I want to ask you this question. Do you actually see people? Do you, do you see, do you try to imagine, you know, the, the, the hurt or the pain? Do you see that in their lives? Do you see it in their eyes? Do you, do you see somebody who's crying and you recognize, you know, that person is crying. There must be something broken there. I wonder if I can go and help. I wonder if I can show love to them or care or compassion for them. If, if I can be somebody who could, who could express God's love to them, to, who could, you know, show God's forgiveness to them. Or do you only judge them? It's so easy to judge other people. This is why Jesus had to tell us to take the log out of our own eyes before we take the splinter out of, you know, out of someone else's eyes. Are you, a, are you Simon the Pharisee? Or do you recognize that actually maybe in some ways you're more like the woman who weeps at Jesus' feet and you stand in need of God's grace? 